Where's the time go? Well, this morning, Pastor Ron was going to preach, but as you know, Pastor Ron has had, uh, has, has had his hands full just uh, getting better from his uh, quintuple bypass surgery that was performed just about a month ago now. And um, so continue to pray for him. He's doing well, uh, continues to, um, to heal. And so since, um, since I had already had somebody scheduled to speak for me and being lazy by nature, um, I decided, well, I'll, I'll just still have somebody speak today. And so I've given uh, Charles another chance to come and share with you this morning. He's going to talk about uh, what has happened this past year. Now, I want you to know that, that um, in the middle of the message day, we are going to open it up for a few minutes for any of you who would kind of like to share. Uh, Charles, as part of, the, part of the message, is going to be challenges that many of you have faced uh, over the past year, whether they were health challenges, financial challenges, or whatever else. And if you want to take a few minutes, and, and I stress a few minutes, to share what's, uh, what's happened in your life. We're gonna open it up and give you a chance to do that. We will keep an eye on the clock uh, because we have kids upstairs and teachers uh, that we really wanna respect You know the, the time the teachers have, but we do wanna give you a chance to do that. So let's welcome Charles Wolf as he will come and bring the message today. Yeah, as Mike said, this was supposed to be Pastor Ron's spot and um, I do wish that he could be up here today, but uh, it does almost feel somewhat appropriate that I could be here on the last Sunday of, of the year, because it was almost the first Sunday of the year that Corey and I started coming here, and it honestly was not until after leaving my first sermon here at Rock Ridge, somewhere in between the quotes from Abraham Lincoln and Scripture, that I decided Christianity was going to be for me. And and as the church has changed and evolved over the year, so too have I. It's, it's almost like we've been walking this journey together. Um, most Sundays I get to go up and, and teach the high school kids and, and for the parents whose children those are, I thank you for that opportunity and for those children, I thank you for paying attention. But it is only through God that any of this was possible. That this incredible transformation I've enjoyed experiencing throughout 2014 could have been made true. And so perhaps more than anyone else here in the church today, I can say confidently that I've been given more gifts and more blessings and feel honored and humbled to stand here right now and deliver this message today as we look back on the year that we've had. Because we are a very blessed church, and I know that's a little hard to understand when you're sitting in white folding chairs. <laughs> but it's the truth. We may not be blessed with coffers full of gold coins, but we are rich in family, more so than any other organization I've been a part of, and that includes the United States Army. I've seen this family come together hand in hand and, and pray over one another and be there for each other and make sure that no matter what, we all got just what we needed to get by. Of course those blessings come from God, but it's been an it's just an incredible year just to watch all of you and to be part of this. So we're going to look back on the blessings we have experienced this year. And the place I'd like to start is by highlighting the baptisms we've had, of which I was one. And so is Corey and Mariah, and I know I'm leaving some people out. So if you've been baptized this year and you've joined our church, please just take this moment and stand up and, and receive this minute that we're going to take to... Uh, to recognize you. And... We thank you not just for receiving the Spirit of Christ in you and, and dedicating your life to Him. These are pictures, by the way, from our baptisms throughout the year. But um, we thank you for doing it with us. We thank you for joining the family and letting it grow. 
Oh, that's Pat Kelly. <laughs> but um, we cannot be more thankful for the people who we have here today. And so for those who have taken the plunge this year, who's that handsome fellow? <laughs> but um, for those who have taken the plunge this year, who have accepted Christ and, and made their public declaration to follow him, you know, we thank you for, for joining us here at Rock Ridge Church. And it's important to note what exactly baptism means to this church. Unlike some faiths, we don't believe it's your gateway to salvation. It's not a box you have to check off before you're going to get through the pearly gates at the end. What it really is, is your public declaration, ordained by the church, observed by the church, and recognized by the church, as dedicating or rededicating yourself to accepting and following the spirit and the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's something we're honored to be a part of, and it's something we have the utmost respect for. And if it is something that you haven't done, or you feel you need to do again, we would love to do even more in 2015. So never be afraid to raise your hand and say, I would like more information or I'd like to participate. We know baptism is important from Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, it's written, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. We've been in the book of Acts for the last couple of months, learning the story of the early church. And it's clear to them how big of a deal baptism was. We can go to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day, that day, about 3,000 souls. Acts chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We appreciate baptism. Here. We recognize how important it is on your spiritual journey. And though it's not, like I said, something you have to do to be saved, we thank you for taking part in it and for giving us that blessing of experiencing it with you. Now, kin to baptisms are our baby dedications. Babies, of course, most babies, I'll say, can't quite comprehend the importance of baptism. And so we choose not to baptize our small infant children, our newborns, but instead we have a process where the parents can come up here and, and dedicate their child to Christ, recognize him or her for the gift that that child is from the Lord. And that can be backed up by Scripture too. Psalm 127 Verse 3, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. <clears throat> Even Jesus was dedicated to the Father. Book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 22. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. We love the opportunity to take that moment with new parents and their new child and make a vocal declaration that, yes, they're going to do everything reasonably within their power to make sure that child walks on the right road. And I know we had two baby dedications that I can remember off the top of my head, Jude and Haley. So would those parents please stand up and take a moment of applause as we thank you for bringing your children here and making that promise before us all. It's through our children that we will be allowed to carry on the spirit of the Lord. And we're so thankful for the parents who have brought their kids here to promise that they're going to try. That's the most we can ask out of any of them, that they try. Now, like Mike said, in a minute, we're going to open up the floor to some, some conversations and some stories. But our blessings take a lot of different faces. It's not just the good stuff where we all get to get together at the Kelly's house for hamburgers and sandwiches and baptisms, which we do appreciate, by the way. Thank you. We are blessed by our challenges. We are blessed 
by the experiences of hardship we get to watch people go through. We are blessed to look at the examples of their spirit as they go through them. I would be honored if Graham started our storytelling today. But before I invite him up here, I'm only going to say, watching Graham go through the complications that God has put before him this year should be considered one of the biggest blessings we all got to receive. Because his spirit, though his body may be failing him, never did. He's got the spirit of a lion, but not just any lion, a lion that's made out of iron or something. <laughs> you couldn't break this guy if you tried. When he had to really have that moment where he sit and told us, well, they said they don't know. This, this could be it for me. There's one procedure that they're going to give a shot to, but we don't know how it's going to work out. You know what he said to us? He said, well, if I go, praise the Lord. If I'm healed, praise the Lord. <laughs> and while it physically sucks for Graham, that statement, that spirit, that example is a gift to the rest of us. If you can watch that and not turn your eyes back inward and say, wow, I hope to aspire to that kind of spirit, to that brand of courage. Then you just aren't trying hard enough. I'm sorry, but I can't think of a better way to put it. That's a textbook, storybook example of the kind of spirit you should have. So Graham, if you would do me the honor of telling us a brief version of what you've gone through in 2014. Graham is, is on me all the time to allow this kind of thing to happen. <laughs> and so, buddy, you're up. Just tell us, tell us what the Lord's been doing. Well, it's been a change of program <clears throat> because um, up to this year, uh, kind of a charmed life. sickness, never broke a bone, and could work hard, and I still can some, but um, a few limitations. But um, in um, April, got uh, diagnosed with MDS, which is uh, bone marrow cancer, normally uh, terminal, and <clears throat> so... That's a little dis disconcerting, you know, if you love life and you want to live. And I think it's normal to want to live and to enjoy your family and your loved ones. So, um, <clears throat> but I think, um, you know, a month from today, it'll be 50 years that we accepted Christ our Savior. I did, and he did a few weeks before that. God has been so good in opportunities to serve him over the years and to take care of it. And if you're really in God's hands, it doesn't matter if you have cancer or what, you get out in the highway, get knocked off any time, you know, or all sorts of other ways. <laughs> so you just got to rest that you're in his hands and what he wants to do, let him do it. But uh, I believe his promises, and a lot of them in regard to healing, so that's where my trust is. And uh, if I'm wrong, you know, it's will be with the Lord. And if I'm right, they'll be around to bother you for a while. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just God's so good, and we, uh, I just like to say that. We feel so blessed as a family, and uh, Christmas is a time when we can all be together, and we just love being with our kids, and somehow they love being with us. I don't understand that part of it, and their grandkids, and now a lot of great grandkids, and uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, 
and brothers and sisters, period, you know, as far as your family. So uh, talk about blessed times. We just had so many of them. Our uh, cup is full. So we just want to praise God. Thank him for loving us despite ourselves <laughs> and wanting to use us. And uh, always want to have the spirit of wanting to be used. And sometimes that lags a little bit, but um, uh, we just got to depend on him because he gives the power to do whatever he calls us to do and the desire and uh, hopefully the love for him because that's number one. I want to I wanna mention one thing that is very much has to do with Graham, and that you see in the back here, serving the, uh, the persecuted church through prayer, all of, that, all of that stuff back there. Well, as you know, we're moving in February. February 1st will be our first service at the property. And as a result of that, there have been some pastors of churches who have come through here to check out the facility and, and look at it with the, with the intention of perhaps leasing it after we're done. Well, there was a, um, a father from a Coptic Orthodox Church, who came through here, and he was all dr very impressively dressed, dresses much better than I do, looks a whole lot more impressive than I do, and uh, and they were, he was coming through here to look, and he was looking at 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 um, you know at, at the posters back there. He says, "Oh, you support the persecuted church?" And I said, "Yeah, we have a guy in our church who makes sure that we pray for the persecuted church," and um, and I was looking, and he came from Egypt. Uh, and he, and so I, I assumed he knew exactly what was going on. I said, you've probably experienced this firsthand, haven't you? He said, yes, I've been a part of a church which have been, the church has been burned down, and uh, therefore we're here in the United States because we, we were greatly persecuted in Egypt. So, Graham, thank you for making sure that we keep praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world through the persecuted church. God bless you. Yeah, and, and Pastor Ron is also is big 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 on that okay Charles. <clears throat> now in the same spirit of these stories of sickness and wellness I also wanted to mention they couldn't be here today but um, the Toby family they're in Arizona today I can't fathom why <laughs> but Pat Toby is finally nearing the end of a, a long and arduous struggle with cancer. And when I say the end, I don't mean that in a negative way because she's winning. <laughs> um, from what I understand, she's been fighting this fight since 2007. And in her own accord, she, she told me that she had over 74 chemotherapy treatments trying to fight this thing. And, and now, in 2014... She's experienced clean scans. Pat Toby is cancer-free today. So if ever you wonder, if you go home today and you sit and you pray and you say, I know I'm supposed to be thankful, but I don't know what for, remember those two stories. And you can be thankful for that if absolutely nothing else. Now, of course, we go through struggles other than what happens in our bodies, especially in years like these, it seems. Some of us lose jobs or fall on financial hardship. I know I can certainly tell a story along those lines. When I came here for that first meeting in January, I had just taken a new job at a cluster of radio stations in Palm Springs, doing what I thought was my life's calling to work in radio, marketing, and promotion. So all those silly contests, be color 10, win a pair of tickets, blah, blah, blah. That was my job. Um, and I thought, hey, this is what I love doing. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And then in May, I was unceremoniously laid off from that job. I had no idea what to do. I had no idea where to go. But opportunities kept coming by. And I kept thinking, oh, maybe this is the one God's giving me. Maybe this is his gift to me that I can, I can get another job and keep working in radio like I think he wants me to. And I watched one, two, and then three. Golden should have had him in the bag, knew somebody who knew somebody, opportunities slide right by me into someone far less qualified, my humble opinion. 
<laughs> and I sat there scratching my head wondering, what could it be that God wants me to do? And then I was linked up with an organization that said, we can make you a teacher. And it was only shortly after I had been given the opportunity to teach the Sunday school to the high school kids here. And somehow, with only that mark and a couple of references to what I did in the Army, God gave me a teaching job. And in January, I'll start teaching digital photography at Etiwanda High School, hopefully building the experience and tools that a man might need to stand up here every Sunday, someday, and teach all of you. Now, these struggles do scare us. These complications with employment or finances or anything else are frightening. But if you trust in God, and I'm, this is all on experience now, but if you trust in God and you put your faith in that and you don't let yourself get shaken to the point that, that you would curse Him or lose your faith, wonderful rewards will come your way. I want to reference now a, a verse that even before I was a Christian always gave me comfort. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it's verses 4 through 7, for those of you following along at home. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds in Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. For if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will partake in the consolation. Effectively, what that means is we are given struggles and we are given comforts. And if we are given struggles, almost like I said about Graham, he's an example to all of us. It's for the salvation of the rest of us. And so we can be made stronger by our tribulations and then turn to those around us and say, you don't have to be afraid because God was there for me and I know he's going to be there for you too. Perhaps the blessing that we have talked most about this year is the new church property. I don't know if you guys have heard yet, but we're moving in February. And we've been so blessed to take an active role on that property this year, perhaps more than any other year. I don't know, I haven't been here. Um, but in February, we kicked off our fundraiser for the property that has returned amazing dividends for the church. You guys have been such faithful and wonderful givers, and we can't be more thankful for living up to the pledges that you made all the way back then. We had the Easter service on that property. Don't you guys remember how fun that was? flowers and the kids were there and there were baby chicks that came from somewhere for them to play with. We got a great message from Mike and we took a short peek at what heaven might really be like for us. We worshiped there again in June and had another fantastic time. In August, for the very first time, we put up a tent that belonged to us. And in September, we worshiped under that tent. And last month we took it down, but we'll leave that part up. <laughs> but to receive these incredible blessings, to look at the development of that property, to change the plans that had been in place so that they can accommodate us when we move out there early next year, not only can we recognize these things as blessings from God that we've received throughout the year, but we certainly can recognize that we are being prayerfully and spiritually guided by Him throughout this entire process which is going to take us into 2015. I want to look at the big picture of 2015 first, before we shrink it down to just this church. Because a lot happened for Christians in the world this year. I'm sure you've all read the headlines. It's a scary place out there. It's easy here, sure, fine. In the United States, and especially in this part of Riverside County, it's a very spiritually alive place here. Mike pointed out that map just a couple minutes ago, and I want to ask you, before he pointed to it, and I'm directing your attention to it now, how many times did you notice it? The persecuted church is a very real thing in this world. To help put that in perspective, 
I have brought along a Christmas letter that Pastor Zaid Abedini wrote to his family this year. For those of you who don't know his story, Pastor Abedini is currently being held in an Iranian prison. He was over there as a missionary. In his letter, he wrote, Merry Christmas. These days are very cold here. My small, my small space beside the window is without glass, making most nights unbearable to sleep. The treatment by fellow prisoners is also quite cold and at times hostile. Some of my fellow prisoners don't like me because I am a convert and a pastor. They look at me with shame as someone who has betrayed his former religion. The guards can't even stand the paper cross that I have made and hung next to me as a sign of my faith in an anticipation of celebrating my Savior's birth. They have threatened me and forced me to remove it. This is the first Christmas that I am completely without my family. All of my family is presently outside of the country. These conditions have made this upcoming Christmas season very hard, cold, and shattering for me. It appears that I am alone, with no one left beside me. These cold and brittle conditions have made me wonder why God chose the hardest time of the year to become flesh, and why he came to the earth in the weakest human condition, as a baby. Why did God choose the hardest place to be born in cold weather? Why did God choose to be born in a manger and in a stable, which is very cold, filthy, and unsanitary, with an unpleasant smell? Why did the birth have to be in such a way that it was not only hard physically, but also socially? It must have brought such shame for Mary and her fiancé that she was pregnant before marriage in the religious society of that time. Dear sisters and brothers, the fact of the gospel is that not only is it the story of Jesus, but it is the key of how we are to live and serve like Jesus. Today we, like him, should come out of our safe comfort zone in order to proclaim the word of life and salvation through faith in Jesus Christ and the penalty of sin that he paid on the cross and to proclaim his resurrection. We should be able to tolerate the cold, the difficulties, and the shame in order to serve God. We should be able to enter into the pain of the cold, dark world. Then we are able to give the fiery love of Christ to the cold, wintry manger of those who are spiritually dead. It may be that we will be called fools and traitors and face many difficulties, but we should crucify our will and wishes even more until the world hears and tastes the true meaning of Christmas. Christmas means that God came so that he would enter your hearts today and transform your lives and to replace your pain with indescribable joy. Christmas is the day that the heat of the life-giving fire of God's love shone in the dark, cold, wintry, frozen hearts and burst forward into this deadly and wicked world. So this Christmas, let the lava-like love of Christ enter into the depth of your heart and make you fiery, ready to pay any cost in order to bring the same lava love to the cold world around you, transforming them with the true message of Christmas. Pastor Zaid Abedin. Many of us were blessed with being able to enjoy a comfortable Christmas. Obviously, Pastor Zaid was not. But his message is especially pertinent for us right now. Notice he says, step out of your comfort zone. That was his calling for us, right? He's suffering. He knows what it's like. It's cold and it's dark where he is and nobody likes him. When we move, if this is our comfort zone, none of it's coming with us. And I hope you guys are ready for that. I hope you guys can understand the spirit of this message is that no matter what changes, no matter who comes up to you and laughs and says, oh, don't you guys worship in a big empty tent off of a dirt road in Menifee? You can look them confidently in the eye and say, yes, we're servants of God and we're here to spread his word. You won't let anything deter you in this entire process. So now we can focus on us. Now we can think a little bit closer to, to what's ahead for Rock Ridge. Like I said, we're moving. We've been prayerfully thinking about this for months now. To find our confidence, we turn to the second half of a verse in Exodus chapter 13. It's Exodus 13, 3. And again, this is only half of it. For by a strong hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. The church is going to look and feel a lot different for a little while. It might be cold in the winter and hot in the summer. Again, it is a big empty tent. But... We know by a strong hand are we being pushed out of here. None of this was done, well, I won't say none of this was done on a whim. We didn't really think about it that long. But none of this was done without prayer. None of this was done without asking for spiritual guidance. 
None of this was done without turning to the Word to put us together. Thankfully, we spent the last two months trying to get everybody ready. We started, I had to take a moment when I realized this, but we started in the book of Acts all the way back in October. And each message, though we didn't realize it at the time, has frankly been placed to get us all ready for this huge project we've been working on. We can relate what we're doing to the story of the early church because what they went through was big and ambitious and scary too. They, like us, were trying to start a church in an unchurched world with a message that many could consider offensive and unpopular. One thing you have to realize about this move is that it isn't just a move. We're not the San Diego Chargers going from San Diego to Los Angeles. We are a new team in a new city. We need all of our players and our coaches and our leadership to be at the top of their game because we have to make an impression on these people. One thing the Raiders learned when they moved to Los Angeles is that when you lose, you're unpopular. <laughs> Let's not be them. Let's be the team that gets out there and wins. It was Don Weber's favorite saying this year, are you playing to win or are you playing not to lose? Not only are we asking you to play to win, we're asking you to play on our team. So let's look at some of these messages from Acts we've been going through. In our very first message, we looked at the beginning of the early church, the preparation that Jesus gave to his disciples for their new and purposeful lives. We saw how he armed them for the persecution they were going to face. We asked you to spend time with the Lord just as they did to prepare yourself, to arm yourself against negative people coming to you. We marked the arrival of the Holy Spirit and saw how it gave birth to the early church. It was divine and powerful, just like Jesus. We asked you then, and frankly, it's time to ask you again, are you part of that early church? Are you part of this church? We saw how the Holy Spirit made a heart deep change in the disciples. We looked at who they were before and who they became after the Pentecost and illustrated the difference. We marveled at the growing baby of Christ's church. And we looked at a perfect example of a spirit-filled and spirit-guided church. We discussed the importance of learning, of reading, and of loving God's word. We saw the necessity of depending on one another as a family and moving as a singular unit of devoted worshipers. We stressed the necessity of not just partaking of this life that God has made for you, but being sold out to him in your life and asked you if you understood what that really meant. We talked about the importance of being focused and expectant learners, receptive to the Spirit of God, we discussed the true meaning of repentance, illustrated what it really was, and saw how necessary it was for us to experience the full joy of Christ. And perhaps most importantly, we studied on how much we needed to be led by the Holy Spirit to witness to others and to use the powers that Christ promised us to face the challenges that we might experience because of that. If our church is going to make it in this new home, we need to be a few things. We need to be spirit-led. We need to be guided by the Holy Spirit. We need to be a church that learns, that studies over the Word of God, and draws in the lessons that are intended for us to receive. We need to be a church that loves. There can't be negative judgment among the body. We can't let infighting take us over. We need to love each other. We also need to love our new community. Remember, we're trying to make an impression. We need to be a church that serves. Serves one another in some exciting new ways that we're hopefully going to break into, including things like small family groups, and a church that serves the community. Our first sermon out there is going to be commemorated with a blood drive in February. So we're off to a good start. We need to be a church that witnesses. Remembering, of course, what that means. Speak of the things that you've seen and heard, just like Peter did in the book of Acts. Don't be afraid of anyone. And lastly, we need you. 
We need you. We need the version of you that is unafraid. We need you to be in the Word. We need you to be constantly in prayer because none of this is possible without that. We need you to be servants in the community. I know that's hard. Not only is it scary just to go talk to people, but it's scary to think that they're not going to want to receive whatever it is you're offering. But we've got to try. And if we try and try again, I think eventually the new community will learn to latch on to our love and they'll be attracted to whatever it is we have. I want you to realize, I know we've been telling you the story about this property for a while now, but I want you to realize how real this is for us. We have four meetings left here, four. You can count them on one hand without even using your thumb. And if you believe, and I know that you do, that all of this has been planned out from the very beginning, then you must believe that we stand now on the precipice of a new chapter in God's plan for us. Why wouldn't you want to be a part of that? Mountains have been moved to give us this moment right now. My mom used to go on and on and on about appreciating the now, living in the now. And I don't know if we're on the same trip, but I think I get it now. <laughs> Everything from the very beginning, from the loans we weren't supposed to get to the land we weren't supposed to buy to the time we weren't supposed to sell to what we have now has been planned out since the beginning. And we want you to be with us as we move boldly forward into something new. The last little bit of scripture we're going to look at comes from the book of John. And it stresses why it's so important that we pray over this and why we do all of these things. John chapter 15, verse 7. A verse that has a very special meaning for the most beautiful woman in the world, my fiance. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. We've asked a lot of the Lord this year. We've asked for healing. We've asked for opportunity. We've asked for hope. And it's come to us in abundance, in more than we ever could have thought. Ponder on that as we think about the next step. We asked you this year if you were playing to win. Now we need to ask you to have done for us and will do for us. And in your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, one last thing I want you guys to realize. This is the last chance you get to cheer for these guys in 2014. I want you to clap so loud and cheer so loud that you hurt yourself, okay? Give it up one more time for your worship team.